or at least have been in, in prior weeks, so you know the routine. Um, as a reminder, first of all, we of course always like to thank uh, University of California, Berkeley, for uh, hosting this California Fire Science webinar series. Uh, I'm Crystal Colden at University of California Merced. My co-hosts on this series are Dr. Michael Gallner at UC Berkeley and Dr. Jeanette Kobiani-Miquis at UC Merced. Uh, and the three of us have been absolutely thrilled to have all of our speakers uh, this semester talk about a myriad of uh, disparate, disparate aspects of wildfire, um, and today is no exception. Uh, in a few moments, I will introduce our speaker, Dr. Miriam Marler uh, at UCLA. First, I want to remind you uh, that we are also hosting this seminar series in partnership with California Fire Science Consortium, uh, and if you have questions, because this is a webinar, what we are asking is that at the bottom of your screen, you will see the Q and A button. Uh, and if you uh, have a question for Dr. Marler, could you please enter your question into the Q&A box? Uh, and then at the end of her talk, uh, we will go through and ask some of those questions. Um, and at four o'clock, we will switch over to a discussion Zoom. Uh, the link for that Zoom will be provided in the chat box over the course of uh, this discussion and again towards the end. Um, and then anyone who would like to join uh, Dr. Marler for asking additional questions or just hearing some of the discussion going on around this topic uh, is free to uh, leave this webinar and click on that link that will be again in the chat uh, so that they can join that more informal Zoom discussion at four o'clock. So without further ado, I will go ahead and introduce Dr. Miriam Marler, who is an assistant professor uh, at the uh, UCLA Fielding School of Public Health in uh, Global Environmental Change and Environmental Health Sciences Department. Uh, she's an interdisciplinary environmental scientist. She has broad interests in examining interactions between environmental change and public health using remotely sensed data and interdisciplinary modeling techniques. Uh, some of her recent projects include forecasting the influence of different uh, conservation and development policies in Indonesia on fire emissions, air pollution, and regional public health outcomes, measuring the effects of agricultural waste burning on air quality in India, understanding the physical drivers uh, of fire activity in the Western US, and using remote sensing uh, to improve responses to natural disasters. And uh, prior to joining UCLA, Dr. Marler uh, was an associate physical science scientist at the RAND Corporation. Mm -hmm. uh, and she joins us today to give a talk on fires, air pollution, and public health, a remote sensing based perspective. Thank you very much, Dr. Marler. Well, thank you, Crystal, for that introduction. Uh, can everyone hear me okay? No one can actually talk back except uh, okay. us panelists, but we can hear you great. <laughs> okay, perfect. Um, well, thank you again for that introduction. I'm excited to be here today and um, to share some of my work that I have um, recently completed and as well as some ongoing work that is looking at this connection between fire activity, air pollution, and public health. So while we know that fires can have widespread ecological and climate impacts, and I know that um, many of the other speakers in the seminar series have been covering some of these topics, today I'm going to be talking about what this means to public health by how fires contribute to regional air pollution. So I'm going to start in the first part um, of my talk today with a relatively broad global perspective on this issue. And then I'm going to zoom in into a case study in Indonesia. And so for the California Fire Science series, you may wonder why I'm talking about Indonesia. And that's because we have developed a remote sensing based tool and we are starting now um, to think about how these tools are applicable to other parts of the world, including California. So in the last part of my talk today, I will um, I will start talking about how we are adapting our work here in California and some of those applications. 
Now I wanna start with an overview of some recent fires um, around the globe. Starting on the top left um, in Australia, the fires last year uh, killed dozens of people, destroyed thousands of homes and burned um, approximately 16 million um, acres. And this killed animals as well as destroyed um, natural habitat. Moving to the right, um, there's examples from tropical countries um, in Indonesia and the Amazon basin, where fires are set typically to clear and prepare land for farming. Um, but these can often burn out of control. And finally, closing the loop in California, this is an image from the Getty fires last fall um, that threatened communities in Western LA, uh, close to where I'm based at UCLA. Um, though obviously it goes without saying that the fire season this year um, it is something that is deserving of much more attention and research. So the fire activity as well as implications for human health are going to vary according to um, various ecosystem processes. So what I have here is a global distribution of fire activity um, from the Global Fire Emissions Database, or GFED. And this is a satellite-based fire emissions inventory. So on the top, we can think about burned area. So this is simply the spatial extent of burning on the ground. And we see here um, that the, the highest areas with um, burned area are typically in Central and Southern Africa. That's in those red shades. Um, but moving to the bottom, we can also think about emissions or the smoke from fires. And emissions are going to depend not only on um, burned area and the type of fuel, but also burning conditions. And this is something that I'll be uh, talking about with regards to the Indonesia case study, as well as our work in California. And that's thinking about how fuel loads um, are going to change emissions air quality and public health outcomes. Now these maps on the last slide were showing an average over time, but there's also a lot of variability from year to year. So I have here um, annual results from the same GFED database. And on the top plot, we have um, global emissions. And um, then I've also pulled the relevant data for temperate North America, which is more relevant for California, as well as equatorial Asia. So there are a couple of key takeaways when we're thinking about this variability at the global or very broad regional scales. Um, first, we see emissions variability over time. And um, some of this is due to the variability in the types of vegetation that is burning. Um, we see in this top plot on the global scale that um, savanna burning, which is in yellow, is relatively constant from year to year. But then if we move to temperate North America, we see the influence of forest fires in green, and there's variability um, from year to year. And finally, moving to the bottom in equatorial Asia, we see very strong interannual variability and the influence of different fire types. And I'm gonna be getting into this later on, but it includes peat fires, which you see in black, as well as um, deforestation and degradation fires, which is in gray. So for my research, when we're interested in questions about how smoke pollution is influencing health, we're also interested in the various drivers that are contributing um, to these air quality impacts. And for this, we consider how fires interact with both human and natural systems. So this is a simple diagram to give you an overview of some of the variables that we take into account. So starting with the influence of climate, um, we think both about the shorter term variability in fire seasons, as well as longer term trends um, that are changing how frequent and how severe burning conditions can be. Moving to the bottom right, we can consider vegetation type. So here again, we're thinking about fuel loads, how much material there is that's available to burn, and how this varies in different parts of the world. Um, again, in higher fuel load systems, there will be more fire emissions. And this also incorporates elements um, of natural fire regimes. 
And then finally, moving over to human activities, we can think about how people provide both admission sources, and this could either be intentionally, like clearing a natural forest for agriculture, or unintentionally through accidental sparks that can start a wildfire. And we can also consider suppression. So how people have changed natural fire regimes, which is um, particularly important here in California. But now let me turn to the focus of my talk today, which is how fires can impact public health. So there are two broad categories for the health risks from fires. First, we have the local impacts on public safety. And this is for communities who live close to fires as well as our first responders. But today I'm going to be focusing on the regional scale impacts of fires on health through the contribution to air pollution. Fires emit trace gases, which contribute to air pollutants like ozone. But what I'll be zooming in and focusing on today is the contribution of fires to particulate matter or PM through the emissions, um, pri primary emissions of black carbon and organic carbon. So we see an example on the left um, from the recent fires in Australia about this true regional scale, um, the regional scale issue for public health through how fires influence air quality. You can see that the smoke plumes um, are across much of the southeastern coast. So why is particulate matter or PM so important for public health? Um, well, there are different size categories of, of PM and um, what we're most concerned about is fine particulate matter or PM 2.5, which are tiny particles smaller than 2.5 microns in, in diameter. And these tiny particles are the most dangerous for public health. There has been research over the course of decades looking at how particulate matter exposure in general affects public health. And more recently, there have been studies looking specifically at how smoke PM 2.5 is associated with public health outcomes. Um, the strongest research is, uh, looks at how smoke PM 2.5 is associated with all-cause mortality and respiratory morbidity. Uh, this could include asthma, bronchitis, and ammonia. And there has been mixed associations with cardiovascular mortality and morbidity. Um, though there is new emerging evidence. And I also want to highlight that not all people are affected equally by smoke PM 2.5. Um, susceptible populations include people with respiratory and possibly cardiovascular diseases, older adults, children, um, pregnant women, and um, babies in utero. So taken together, um, air pollution from fires is associated with approximately 340,000 deaths per year. And of this, 110,000 deaths per year in equatorial Asia. Um, but there's substantial variability um, because as I've shown in the past few slides, um, we know that wildfire activity isn't constant from year to year. Um, and this plot is showing mortality effects but again, wildfire PM uh, also contributes to other health outcomes. And finally, since the, um, for the, the, my last slide in this introductory material, um, the focus of my talk today is on how we can use remote sensing based tools to look at the influence of fires on air pollution and health. And I just want to give a broad overview of the various types of models and observations that we can use to look at this um, at this issue. So first, with remote sensing data, we can incorporate satellite observations of fire activity with respect to burned area as well as the thermal energy. So that GFED database where I was showing several plots at the beginning is based on these types of metrics. But we can also use remote sensing data to directly observe smoke plumes and air pollution. The second category is thinking about atmospheric models. And these can either look at individual plumes or more broad chemical transport models. 
And I'll be talking today about how we couple remote sensing observations of fires with these chemical transport model tools. And finally, ground-based observations are also very important, and this can include both permanent and temporary air quality monitors. And I won't be talking too much about this today, although we do use ground-based monitors um, in our work to validate our modeling and remote sensing-based efforts. And um, just to, to reiterate, many of these approaches can be blended together. Okay, so now moving in to um, the case study in Indonesia. I'm going to be discussing um, a paper that came out last year um, that I worked on with this fantastic team. So I wanted to start by recognizing all of my co-authors on this work. Um, I have a link here to our paper if anyone is interested in further details, um, but I do want to recognize um, all of my co-authors. I think as will become very clear as I get into our, our scientific approach, it wouldn't be possible without bringing together an interdisciplinary team drawing from remote sensing, atmospheric chemistry, public health, and conservation. Okay, so let me start this case study with a little context for why I'm going to share an example of fire pollution in Indonesia. So a few years ago in the fall of 2015, Indonesia experienced an intense fire season that spread haze across Indonesia and much of the region. Emissions were on par, um, emissions from fires were on par with several countries' annual fossil fuel emissions. And I have here a sample of headlines that I took um, during the event. You can see how disruptive um, the fires were across the region causing a rift between Indonesia and neighboring countries like Singapore and Malaysia. And at one point, uh, the fires were so bad that Indonesia was evacuating infants and new mothers from the worst affected regions. And Singapore uh, was closing schools and various businesses. So as these news articles hinted at, Indonesia is a fire hotspot on the global scale. Um, taken on average, Indonesia's fire emissions are less than 10% of the global fire emissions um, total. But in high fire years, um, this proportion has increased closer to 40%. And so taking this perspective about how Indonesia's fire activity is really important from a global scale, what our team was interested in addressing is how we can build an integrated scientific framework that connects land management, fire activity, air pollution, and public health. And as I'll show um, with the results from our study, we built a, an online decision support tool to help support future conservation efforts to reduce fire activity that would maximize the public health benefit. So going back to this simple diagram about the various factors that um, contribute to smoke pollution. In this study, um, we zoomed in on a couple of these interacting factors in Indonesia. From the climate perspective, um, we looked at interannual variability in fire activity in the recent past, um, although we have not yet looked at the potential influence of future climate. As far as vegetation type, we were really focused on fuel loads. In Indonesia, um, there are, uh, Indonesia is one of the, the tropical countries that has the most peatland area, which is a very high fuel load system. And then thinking about human activities, um, in this context, we're more interested in how people serve as ignition sources for fires and how this is linked to various um, types of land management activities. Okay, so before I get into the results from our study, I want to delve a little bit deeper into what is driving this severe pollution or haze in equatorial Asia. So there are multiple interacting factors that contribute to fires. And so as I mentioned in the last slide, we focused in on, on three primary factors. 
The first is meteorology. Um, in Indonesia, El Nino is one of the drivers, the primary drivers of drought conditions from year to year. The second is land use and land cover, um, land cover change. And here we're primarily interested in agricultural activities, as well as the legacy of land use change in the past and how degraded areas might be vulnerable to future fires. And third, peatlands. As I mentioned, this is a very carbon rich fuel source. So our team looked up these interacting factors and used that to estimate air pollution impacts, which I have on the right. Um, so we see here, um, you know, fires are contributing to regional haze. And we looked at how elevated particulate matter, PM 2.5 concentrations um, from fires are associated with various negative health outcomes and how various land management strategies could be implemented to reduce these negative health consequences. So let me step through um, these factors in a little bit more detail, and then I'm gonna get into our results. Um, so a critical takeaway when we're thinking about interannual climate um, meteor meteorological variability is that in Indonesia, there is a strongly nonlinear relationship between drought and fire activity. So here we see that as rainfall declines, there is a large upswing in fire activity. Um, fires are highly sensitive to drought conditions um, during the dry season. And in Indonesia, as I mentioned previously, El Nino is one of the primary mechanisms that suppresses convection and brings drought conditions. This has most notably happened in 2015, as well as previous years, 1997 and 2006. And another consideration that is an area of active research is how longer term trends with climate change could impact these relationships as well, although we didn't delve into that for this study. The second factor is, the, um, is considering the influence of land use and various human activities. So in Indonesia, forests are cleared for agriculture, typically by fires. And the area that has been cleared is immense. Um, forests and peatlands the size of the UK um, have been cleared since 1990. And most of this clearance is for agriculture and plantations. Here, oil palm, pulpwood for um, the paper industry and timber are all important large scale contributors. And finally, um, we consider how fuel loads in peatlands are influencing fire, fire emissions and the resulting air quality impacts. So peatlands are um, partially decomposed organic matter that store large amounts of fuel below ground. And in Indonesia, there are approximately 15 million hectares of peatlands. And peat, why are we thinking about this from fire, from a fire perspective? Um, peatlands don't normally burn because they are swamp-like ecosystems, but they become highly susceptible to fires after land use. So we see in this photo on the left, um, an example of a peat swamp forest where the trees have been cleared and then the water can be drained off to clear the way for agriculture. And once fires start in drained peatlands, they are extremely difficult to put out. And I wanna go into just a little bit more detail about the variability in Indonesia's fire activity, uh, because this has important implications for both air pollution and human health consequences. This plot is comparing fire emissions in Indonesia with country level fossil fuel emissions. So we see here both the dramatic swings from year to year in fire activity, but also the change in magnitude. So in 1997, for example, Indonesia's fire emissions were more than the entire European Union's annual fossil fuel emissions. And this recent 2015 event um, had uh, fire emissions that were comparable to fossil fuel emissions from countries as large as Japan and India. But beyond these more extreme years, we also see examples of several years where Indonesia's CO2 emissions from fires are more than the country's fossil fuel emissions. And 
now let's move into how Indonesia's fires impact health. And again, when we think about public health, this is not just a local issue for communities close to where the fires occur, but it becomes a true regional issue. Fire pollution affects large parts of Indonesia, but also neighboring countries like Malaysia and Singapore. And this fire pollution is responsible for serious uh, health outcomes. In the 2015 fires, um, which again were the most severe in recent years, um, estimates are that um, the fire pollution from these fires caused approximately 100,000 premature deaths and exposed close to 70 million people to unhealthy levels of air quality around the region. And again, these health impacts are most severe for vulnerable populations, including young children and the, and the elderly. So with this background, um, you know, this is getting into the key question that our team was interested in addressing, which is how can we take information linking together the drivers of fire activity with pollution and public health outcomes to possibly help reduce future fire-related health risks? So in order to do this, our team developed an interdisciplinary framework using the Google Earth Engine platform. So I'm going to just briefly talk about, um, introduce our, the five primary steps in our analysis, and then I'll talk about each um, in a little more detail in the next few slides. So again, the, the goal of this framework is to make the connection between changes in land management, climate, fires, and public health. So first, we classify past changes in land use and land cover, separating these fuel-rich peat areas from non-peat land areas. Second, um, we relate fire emissions to these changes in land use and land cover. And this is a critical step for considering how future land management strategies could alter fire emissions. Third, we projected forward um, future land use and land cover changes uh, for the next decade using um, a business as usual scenario as a, as a benchmark. And we used this business as usual or BAU scenario to assess the effectiveness of different policies. Fourth, we use um, an atmospheric model to estimate the influence of um, organic and black carbon emissions on smoke PM 2.5 and um, air quality at three different receptors. And finally, we use the average annual smoke PM 2.5 exposure to estimate attributable premature mortality for both adults and children. So getting into these pieces in a little bit more detail. Um, so our first step again is looking at land use and land cover. And for this, by using remote sensing observations and other spatial data sets, um, we look to characterize the land surface among a number of different dimensions. This includes land cover, so where forests or degraded lands are located and how that's changing. Where peat lands are located, I've highlighted here um, in Sumatra and Kalimantan, the primary peatland areas, as well as conservation status. The second step is to associate these land use transitions with fire emissions. And to do this, we used um, GFED, that global fire emissions database, and downfield it with MODIS satellite fire detections. So from this, our fire emissions rates um, show both year to year as well as seasonal variability. Um, the typical peak of fire activity in Indonesia is from approximately July to October or, no or November. The third step is to develop future scenarios of land use and fire emissions. And again, for this, we modeled the business as usual or BAU case of land use changes out for the next decade until 2030, and then examined the relative changes for other land management scenarios. Fourth, um, the next step is to understand where emissions are transported in the atmosphere. And for this, we used a type of atmospheric model um, 
that looked at source receptor analysis. This was from the GeoChem chemical transport model and a version of it called the adjoint. So what the adjoint model allows us to do is to quantify how emissions coming from various areas can impact a specific receptor region. Uh, this represents the spatial sensitivity of a receptor to emissions. So in this map on the right, um, for our different receptor regions that we analyzed in this study, Singapore, Indonesia, and Malaysia, the darker red shades show where these, these countries are the most sensitive to changes in fire emissions. And from a computational standpoint, this is really powerful because we can instantaneously calculate how a change in, a, in fire emissions from various scenarios would change PM 2.5 exposure. And this is um, a key advance when we think about making an online decision support tool. And finally, the fifth piece of our analysis is isolating the impact of fires on smoke PM 2.5 and premature mortality, as well as how different land management scenarios could change this. So we examined the influence of smoke PM 2.5 on adult premature mortality, as well as acute lower respiratory infections in children. And before I get into our results, I do want to, I, I mentioned this earlier, but we conducted most of our analysis in Google Earth Engine. And for those in the audience who aren't aware, um, Google Earth Engine is both a, a powerful catalog of publicly available satellite imagery and other geospatial data sets, um, but it also has um, gives scientific researchers access to very powerful computational uh, resources. And so we conducted much of our analysis in Google Earth Engine, and we also built a publicly facing um, online decision support tool using Google Earth Engine. And that's what I have here is a screenshot from the policy support tool that we built. Um, and this is called the Smoke Policy Tool. Um, and what we did here is we translated the scientific framework that I described in the last few slides into this decision support tool that's publicly available. Um, so it, this allows users to design various land management scenarios and then visualize what these results mean for um, changing fire emissions, air quality, as well as the public health impacts. So this tool, the smoke policy tool is available to anyone um, via the link that I have here on our slide. So how exactly does the smoke policy tool work? Um, well, in the first two steps, uh, users can choose between various fire emission scenarios as well as meteorological years. So this provides a range due to that interannual variability in fire activity um, that we've seen is so important in this region. Next, um, users can choose um, a country level population weighted receptor from one of the three countries that, um, that are available, Indonesia, Malaysia, and Singapore. And then um, finally, users can choose a policy of interest. So they can explore how reductions in fires associated with various industries, um, political provinces, as well as proposed conservation sites would influence um, fire activity, air pollution, and health. So now I want to step through how we used this tool to examine the influence of peatland burning on public health. So these plots are showing um, total emissions on the left and total burned area on the right for different locations in Indonesia. So the key takeaway here is that Although peatlands account for a relatively minor portion of the land area, less than um, about 20% in Sumatra and Kalimantan, um, most of the fire emissions are attributed to peat fires, more than 60%. So using the smoke policy tool, um, we compared the BAU scenario, um, which estimates approximately 37,000 premature deaths um, per year to a scenario of maximum peatland restoration. And if this were to be undertaken, smoke ex exposure could be reduced by approximately two thirds. 
So again, why is focused, focusing on peatland restoration so important? Well, peat fires emit large amounts of smoke PM 2.5 and are extremely difficult to extinguish. And second, peatlands are located upwind of dense population centers. So they can also have a disproportionate impact on air quality um, where many people are living. And finally, I wanna share a more applied example. Um, one of our collaborators um, on this project um, is from, we collaborated with um, from the Indonesian Peatlands Restoration Agency or BRG. BRG is responsible for restoring up to 2 million hectares of peatlands across Indonesia. So on this um, map on the left, I have the various uh, locations of planned peatland restoration sites by BRG. And we can use the smoke policy tool to calculate the top areas where conservation efforts could be focused to most effectively reduce the exposure. And those are shown um, with these um, boxes in blue. So thinking about some applications of the smoke policy tool, um, you know, the, one of the key takeaways from our analysis is that burning in these high fuel load peatlands um, contributes to high level of fire emissions and regional haze during drought conditions. The online smoke policy tool um, allows regional partners to target the most important areas for their communities to protect from fire uh, in order to reduce the pollution burden. There are several next steps that our team is exploring. Um, one is reducing uncertainties in our input data sets. Um, we built our uh, framework to be flexible and update as new data sets and information become available. And these, uh, I'm gonna talk in a little bit more detail about these, um, these final two points in the rest of my talk today. Um, first is examining additional health outcomes we primarily focused on um, the influence of smoke PM 2.5 on adult mortality, um, but we're also interested in looking at how other health outcomes are affected by this exposure. And then I'll end with discussing how um, we're thinking of applying similar, a similar framework to other parts of the world, including here in the Western US. So to start um, with thinking about these additional health outcomes, um, I'm working with um, a collaborator at the Rand Corporation um, on connecting our smoke pollution work with an on the ground survey called the Indonesia Family Life Survey or IFLS. IFLS is an ongoing longitudinal survey um, that represents more than 80% of the population and it collects socioeconomic and health data, um, including information on individuals, their families and households, their communities, as well as access to various health and educational facilities. Um, there have been five waves of data collection um, starting in the 1990s, and the most recent data collection um, was the fifth wave, or IFLS-5, that occurred during 2014 to 2015. And close to 90% of households have been part of all five waves of the IFLS survey. And we were really interested in exploring this data set because the most recent wave collected new information on subclinical health outcomes. So what do I mean by that? Um, so IFLS 5 collected information on lung function, including um, a, a measure of the degree of obstruction in the lungs, as well as blood pressure, which is a known risk factor for cardiovascular disease. And prior studies have found um, sustained negative effects of fire pollution in Indonesia on lung function, um, but looking at blood pressure has not yet been examined with the IFLS database. So our study objectives here are to um, determine uh, pollution exposure using satellite-derived PM2.5, and then to identify associations with this exposure and various um, health outcomes. 
So starting with our exposure estimates, um, what we have here are annual PM 2.5 exposure for 2014, which is on the top and 2015 on the bottom. And this is from a publicly available um, data set that um, estimates annual surface level PM 2.5 by combining satellite observations, ground observations, and atmospheric um, chemical transport modeling. And so we see here um, that there's, a, there's strong variability between the two years. Um, in 2015, we see um, very extremely high annual PM 2.5 measurements um, on the eastern coast of Sumatra, as well as partially here in southern Kalimantan. And these are the primary burning regions in Indonesia. So what we found is um, that long-term exposure to total PM, so I want to clarify um, the satellite-based data that we are using is looking at total PM 2.5 that isn't able to split um, out the specific contribution of fires. So we found that this, this long-term exposure was associated with reduced uh, lung function, but there were several limitations of this analysis. This was part of a pilot project. And some of that is that the majority of measurements taken in IFLS 5 um, took place in 2014 and the first half of 2015. So when we want to look to the specific influence of fires on PM 2.5, it's not perfectly aligned with when the on the ground um, health survey data was collected. And secondly, um, the, this database gives annual PM 2.5, but for some of these subclinical um, health outcomes that we're interested in, there's a lot of, of daily variability. And so what we're interested in doing in the next phase of this project is linking to our um, atmospheric modeling work that I was sharing previously so that we can start to get to some of this daily variability in pollution and isolate the influence of fires on PM2.5. So to wrap up my, my case study in Indonesia, um, the influence of fire pollution on health in Indonesia provides a framework um, to tie together the causes of fires um, the drivers of fires and how this impacts regional health. So there are multiple factors um, that act together. Um, I mentioned in, in my talk today, uh, thinking about climate, peatlands, as well as land use and human activities. But by starting to connect these pieces together, we can think about policies that would reduce this health risk. And finally, in my last few minutes um, today, I wanted to talk about how this uh, analysis that we've done in Indonesia, what the overall lessons learned are and how we're starting to apply this work here in the Western US. And specifically thinking about California, um, here wildfires have been increasing for the past several decades. And studies have shown that anthropogenic climate change has driven a large part of this increase. So this is an urgent threat for um, people living close to where wildfires occur in the wildland urban interface. But again, it's not just people who are living close, um, close by. As we see in this image um, from the campfire in 2018 in Northern California, the impact of air pollution becomes a regional issue. So going back to this simple diagram of how um, multiple interacting factors contribute to smoke pollution and health, our work in California is focused in on a few of these elements. Uh, we're looking at year-to-year -year variability in fire activity. Um, we're not yet incorporating future climate. Second, um, we're looking at variability in fuel types across the state and how this is contributing to differential uh, health impacts downwind. And finally, here we're interested in various types of human influence, both ignition and suppression, and how that can change the distribution of fire activity across the state. And this is a really important question to be thinking about, because looking to the future, uh, recent studies suggest that the impact of wildfires 
um, on air pollution is going to increase with future climate. Um, this is a study that came out last year, um, and in the, the gray bars, we see that air pollution from other sources, so transportation or industry, um, will likely decline when we're comparing 2000 to um, various future climate scenarios in 2050 and, and 2100. But in the red bars, we see that pollution from wildfires is likely going to increase. This study was conducted across the US, um, but they highlighted that the Western US, including California, is highly vulnerable to these changes. So um, I'm gonna spend just a, a few minutes talking about um, some on preliminary work that is ongoing um, in my lab at UCLA. So here we're interested in um, using remote sensing based tools to look at uh, fire PM 2.5 in California and starting to link to various health outcomes. Our objective here is to focus on uh, large wildfire events and try to better understand how these specific events contribute to um, air pollution levels in California. I want to recognize our collaborators at UC Merced, as well as the fantastic students at UCLA who are working on this. Um, and we have three basic steps that we're working on in this analysis. Um, the first is um, a high resolution fire emissions modeling that improves our estimates of individual wildfire emission events. And this is led by uh, Leroy Westerling at UC Merced. And then the second and third points, we're taking a complementary approach to looking at modeling the air pollution impacts of these large fire events. This includes both plume-based modeling of individual large fire events, and here we're focused in on 2018, and also taking a broader perspective with statewide modeling of PM2.5 smoke pollution over a five-year period. So I wanted to share some um, preliminary results. This is an example from the campfire um, where we're using this, this new fire emissions data set and taken on the day um, the, of the maximum emissions. This is showing the distribution of um, 24 hour average PM 2.5 concentrations at the surface level. And also showing um, the top five counties in the state and the PM 2.5 levels um, that they were exposed to on the corresponding day. And again, um, this is just showing the influence of smoke PM 2.5. So the likely exposure when you consider other sources of particulate matter um, would mean that the overall exposure le level is even higher. In addition to this work, um, we are collaborating with um, a, a team as it's called SNAP or Science for Nature and People Partnership. And there is um, a SNAP team specifically looking at the influence of wildfires in human health and um, looking at um, various trade-offs between wildfires and prescribed burning and managed fires on downwind air quality and public health outcomes. And I've listed here um, a contact um, if anyone is interested in getting involved or learning more. This is a highly collaborative group um, and um, I would be happy to share information if that would be helpful. So with that, I would like to wrap up. Um, I wanna emphasize that the goal of a lot of our projects um, you know, that I've done with, um, with various collaborators is looking at how we can incorporate remote sensing observations to map the intersection of land management, climate variability, fire activity, pollution, and then taking that to public health outcomes. And one of the strengths of this remote sensing based approach is that we are consciously building it to be flexible so that we can incorporate new data and scenarios as they become available. And also by using this publicly available data um, and making our analysis publicly available as well, we're providing um, access to anyone. So the, the smoke policy tool anyone can use to evaluate different conservation scenarios and make those links between land management fires and health. Uh, so with that, I'll end and I'm happy to take any questions.
Okay, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Marler, for an excellent presentation. Um, and just a reminder to all of our listeners uh, that if you would have a question for Dr. Marler, could you please enter it into the Q&A box uh, with the button for which is on the bottom of your screen. Um, and that in 10 minutes, we will go ahead and move over to the discussion uh, portion of the uh, the presentation uh, and anyone who would like to stick around for a sort of less formal discussion uh, is welcome to do that. The Zoom link is in the chat uh, because this presentation, this webinar will end at four o'clock. So uh, without further ado, um, so we have a question uh, that was asked early on and, and you've gone into some of this over the course of the talk, but um, Samuel asks, how do you distinguish between uh, PM 2.5 smoke versus other sources uh, such as dust? Uh, well, thanks for the question. That, that's a, an important um, distinction to make. And that's one of the reasons why we turn to using um, an atmospheric modeling type approach um, for the smoke policy tool development. And with this, um, you can track via different emissions inventories how individual um, contributors uh, influence downwind PM 2.5. So we can track fire-related um, black carbon and organic carbon emissions, as well as natural sources like dust or other anthropogenic sources like transportation and industry. And um, from that, the other, the second case study in Indonesia that I shared some work there we were using a satellite-based product that looks at total uh, PM 2.5. And so with that, it's including um, all sources together and isn't able to distinguish smoke PM 2.5 specifically. Okay. Uh, we have another question that asks uh, similarly, right? How are emissions from various sources examined and segregated from, from other sources? Um, and it sounds like that's very similar to what you just answered. Yeah, and I would build on that a little bit with, um, you know, one of the advantages to using, I described it as the geochem adjoint model. And this allows us to not only isolate individual sources, so fires from industry or transportation or dust or sea salt, but also to look at individual fire emission scenarios. So since the adjoint model represents um, the, the spatial sensitivity of downwind pollution exposure to changing emissions, that means we can look not only at all fires that occurred across the course of the season, but we can zoom specifically and say fires from this specific location, or we can look at fires coming from oil palm conversion or fires coming from degraded areas. And so that's another tool um, that we were able to use that's highly relevant when we're thinking about these policy relevant um, decisions that we're trying to support. Uh, we have a question from Nicholas that asks, um, I, the one question I had is Indonesia is the only major country that has, oh, I'm sorry, I'm asking wrong. Is Indonesia the only major country that has peatland type fires or are there other nations with similar agricultural industries and fires? I know some African nations last year had a large amount of fires as well as parts of Brazil. And I was wondering if they had any similarities. Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, I have focused in, uh, in my work in Equatorial Asia. So Indonesia has, uh, is one of the tropical countries that leads in terms of peatland areas. Um, I haven't done work before in Africa, but I believe there's been some recent research that has mapped the distribution of previously unknown peatlands um, in some parts of Africa as well. Um, but it's not just tropical countries. There were some severe fires in Russia, for example, um, a couple of years ago that were linked to peat burning there. Um, the second part of the question, you know, linking fire activity in general from Indonesia with um, events in Africa and the Amazon, I think that there the key um, element to consider is uh, the influence of land use change and deforestation on fire activities. So 
uh, much of the, the fires that occurred in the Amazon basin last year, and, and there's been um, a high level of fire activity there this year as well, has been linked to the clearance of natural forests um, for agriculture and, um, and pastures. And we have a question from Karen. She says, thanks for the talk. How do you think about modeling ignitions in both the Indonesia and California work? So I'm not sure I entirely understand the question, um, but I'll, so I'll, I'll interpret it the way that I, um, that I can, and you can ask a, a follow-up if I don't get it right. Um, so as far as ignitions, we're interested in fire sources. And so what we do is we link, um, we use remote sensing data to link changes in land use um, and land cover change and overlay that with other satellite observations of fire activity. So let me give an example. Um, in Indonesia, we look at how have natural forests, let's say it's a, a peat swamp forest, been converted for oil palm. And what is, how does the distribution of fire activity, what does that look like over the course of that conversion process? In California, we're interested in looking at um, how various, you know, the sources of fire emissions in various ecosystems are disproportionately uh, contributing to downwind health impacts. So we're looking at this primarily by uniting um, land use and land cover change observations, as well as um, fire detection, both burned area and thermal anomalies too. We have a question from uh, Maria. What type of in situ sensors are used to validate the remote sensing data concerning smoke PM 2.5? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, in Indonesia, our um, modeling based um, efforts have been, um, we validate with on the ground sensors across the region. So um, the coverage isn't quite as dense as we have in California, but we look to leverage all available on the ground sensors and use that, uh, you know, the point measurement of PM 2.5 but um, to use that to val validate our total models PM2.5. Um, so we use a mix of ground-based sensors and in past work, we also look at satellite aerosol optical depth, which is a column measurement um, of aerosols in the atmosphere and use that to validate um, temporal trends in, in smoke PM2.5 as well. And I think we have just a couple minutes to answer this final question. Uh, we'll ask, will the smoke policy tool integrate with alert or warning systems so that more informed public health notices can accompany the typical AQI notices such that vulnerable populations and others can look to community or family fo focused mitigations like air purifiers and masks, depending on other more detailed data points and metrics? Uh, that's a great question, and that's an, an ex I know we're running out of time, so that's actually a, an excellent question to wrap up with. You know, the current version of the smoke policy tool, given the, um, the various amounts of data, um, satellite observations, land use change maps um, that we needed to incorporate into that interdisciplinary um, framework, there was a lag in the availability of a lot of these data sets. So it current version of the smoke policy tool is not available in near real time, but we also recognize how useful that would be. And so that's something we're definitely interested in is how can we adapt this framework now that we have the connection, we've mapped the connections using past observations, how can we translate that into a framework that could help in near real time or with short, um, short range forecasting, for example, to look at an alert and warning system. So the answer is not currently, but it's something that we're really interested in and our team has started to explore um, the feasibility of what that exactly would entail. Okay. Everyone, would you please join me in thanking uh, Dr. Marlier for an excellent presentation. 
Uh, and I would remind everyone that uh, the link for the discussion room uh, is currently in the chat. So please go ahead over and click on that link and you'll be moved over to the room uh, where we will have our informal discussion uh, and it will open in just a minute here. There's a bit of a lag. Um, and thank you again very much, Dr. Vermeer for an excellent talk. Thanks. Thanks for having me.